In a fast-paced world, many of us struggle with overthinking and worry that leaves us feeling overwhelmed or stuck. In this podcast, we will hear stories of successful individuals and have conversations and ways to reach our true potential by embracing every micro detail of our identity, especially the flaws that make us unique. This is your host, Maria Grace Wolk. I'm a Filipino american entrepreneur, psychotherapist, and mom of two boys. And my mission is to amplify diverse perspectives and experiences and inspire your journey to wellness and fulfillment. Hi, Jenny. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you and learning more about you and your journey. So can you start us off with introducing yourself and telling us your story? Take us on that path that led you to where you are today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Grace. I am really appreciative of being here and being able to share this with you and with all of the people that you get to connect with, too, through this platform. Like you said, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I have always done trauma work. I'm a trauma psychologist. And I often get the question of, oh, what got you into that field? Why do you do this kind of work? And the kind of quick and dirty answer is me search, which I think brings a lot of people into the mental health field of wanting to better understand themselves and kind of what brought them to different places in their life. And so I was like one of those kind of weird freshman undergrads who on the first day of school declared psychology as my major. And I actually have this, it's almost like a flashbulb memory of being in orientation and they were talking they were like telling us how to declare and they were like probably none of you are even ready to declare yet and I was like oh no I know exactly what I'm doing like I totally know what I'm majoring in in college that was the me search part so I in my experiences growing up had to overcome a lot of stuff and had a lot of my own difficulties and was able to at least get through that well enough to get into college. And I wanted to be able to, my initial goal was to be able to work with teenagers who were dealing with substance abuse issues because that's where I had come from. And I wanted to be able to give back to kids that I saw as going through similar things as myself. So that's why I knew right away. Did you or did you grow up around it? Both. My dad was an addict and I had lots of fun with drugs as a teenager. (laughs) Curious teenager, right? Yeah. (laughs) And I did a lot of risky things and I'm really fortunate that nothing terrible happened and that I was able to overcome a lot of the choices that I had made in adolescence. And I was aware that a big reason that I was able to overcome those things were the couple few supportive people, adults, that were consistent figures in my life. And I don't think I had a very sophisticated understanding of that because I was 18 when I started college. But I was aware that there were people that had helped me and I wanted to be a person like that for others, specifically at that time for teenagers. But I wanted to be a person like that. And I knew that declaring my major in psychology would set me on that path. I was fortunate in that even when I was skipping school to go get high, I still Mm -hmm. was able to pass and get good enough grades to get into college. And the expectation was that I was going to go to college. And I actually never questioned that even through all of the other choices that I was making as a teenager. I just knew that's what I was going to do. And I guess like maybe giving the credit to myself, whatever I have internally, I had some capacities to be able to still get shit done, even when I was making really bad choices. And so I could put the pieces into place to be able to graduate high school. Also, Mm There were just like happenstance things that occurred in my life. So for example, because I was doing a lot of drugs and stuff in high school, I wanted to be cool like my friends and go to this vocational alternative school down. I lived in the mountains in Colorado and this was down Mm -hmm. in Boulder. And the reason I wanted to do that was so I could get high every day on the way to school going down the canyon and to be with all my friends. But the beauty of this 
situation was I was in this alternative high school where every single month you could complete a semester's worth of credit. And so that allowed me to graduate high school a year early. And I really believe if I hadn't graduated a year early, if I had to keep doing that and like living that lifestyle for another year, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know where I would be today because graduating a year early meant I started college a year early. And starting college was just, I don't know, it was like a clean slate for me. I wasn't underneath my parents and was able to make decisions for myself. And I wanted to be in college and I was capable of doing the work. And so I just did it. Jenny, I'm just thinking about as a teenager, we go through these life phases where you're curious and you want to try, let me try these new things to experience life. Was that what was happening? Or is it, let me try these things because things are happening at home that I just don't want to have to think about? It was a coping mechanism, certainly. So I'm from a really small town in the mountains of Colorado. My graduating class from high school was 32 people. Like we all knew each other and grew up together and everyone was friends. And so It was interesting, like in middle and high school, because there were definitely cliques, but like everyone was friends. And so I had interaction with all these different kinds of people and kids, but I didn't really know how to cope with a lot of the stuff that was going on in my own personal life at home. And so I gravitated towards using drugs and alcohol, mainly drugs, some alcohol, but mainly drugs. And it was a coping mechanism. And it also, not just like the avoidance that substances give us, the kind of way to like disconnect from stuff, but also the way that it draws us close to people. I had really strong relationships with a lot of these people, and I'm actually fortunate to still have friendships with some of them today. And so it wasn't that we were just like drugging out together. We really were bonding as teenagers do. And these were the people that I felt could understand me, that I could be on it more honest with and didn't have to hide. So that was something that I needed at that time in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Our friends become family, especially around our teenage years, yeah. right, where we depend on them and they're always there for us. And I used to feel a lot of shame talking about these things, especially, oh, I'm supposed to be some like big fancy psychologist and I have all my shit together. And actually, I was just sharing this story with someone recently. I used to very proudly on my keychain have a keychain that said, I only look sweet and innocent. And this keychain was also, I stole from (laughs) Spencer's gifts at the mall. Spencer's gifts. I I know, do you remember going to Spencer's? (laughs) Yes, I love that story. They had all kinds of cool, crazy stuff. But like it was this one part of me and I had that keychain when I was still living in this way and like making Uh all these choices. But like your reaction too of people are like, wait, what? You used to be like, it was like a thrill of it. But then as I was moving into this profession, I felt a lot of shame and like I couldn't tell anyone about it. And it wasn't until more recent history, maybe like the past five or seven years that I really have been open to talk about that part of my life. And how was that for you? Just like being authentically showing up as yourself? I think part of it is being once I was licensed and a psychologist, like that gives you a certain amount of empowerment. And I also knew that like I was in a very different place in my life. I wasn't using anymore and I hadn't for a long time. As we move through our profession as a student, as a supervisee, as a trainee, there's a lot of disempowerment, which is just inherent to the process of being a learner, right? Right, You're looking to other people to teach you, to guide you, to indoctrinate you into whatever space you're in. But I think being a therapist or any kind of helper or healer, there's this higher level of it and that you have to have things all together and that you can't have your own issues or have your own history. And through shared experiences with fellow therapists and psychologists and healers and helpers, I started to realize that we're all just human. We all have our pasts and we're showing up in the best ways that we can right now. 
acknowledging all those other parts of ourselves, but those other parts, they're not bad parts. They're not contaminating my current self, right? She is just as important to who I am today as the person that you're talking to. But I had to experience that with other professionals and have them really model that for me, whether they knew they were modeling it or not, so that I knew that it was okay to talk about these things. No, absolutely. And I think that's what's happening now, right? That's the turning point in this profession, because I think we were trained or at least to not share a part of ourselves. But now we're finding that that's actually what really helps the client is to share a part of you, to let them know that you are human, that you have these issues too. And nobody's perfect. We're dealing with our own stuff. And that's why we're in this profession, because we're exploring and learning about ourselves. And the more we do that for ourselves, the better we can be there for our clients. And especially with trauma, right? Because trauma is like a whole thing of its own. And you're right. I remember you sharing that, or at least I believe in your, somewhere you shared that one of the toughest times of your profession was actually being surrounded by all of these therapists, right? Where you would expect to find like the comfort or just a helping hand. But instead, you felt isolated, alone. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So in addition to the clinical work I do with trauma and PTSD, I also work with fellow trauma therapists and other helpers and healers to help support them with the inevitable experience of vicarious trauma. And I do that work because I have been there. I have experienced, I will continue to experience vicarious trauma because of the nature of my work. But there are times when it got really bad and really dark and bleak because I felt so alone, even when surrounded by other trauma therapists. And the time that we're talking about right here was a huge contrast to what I had experienced previously in my career. I was really fortunate to come from a graduate program and training opportunities where I felt really supported and safe by professors, supervisors, my fellow colleagues and students. And even then moving into my first kind of stages of my career as like a fully licensed baby psychologist felt that way. And then there is a time in my career where I did not, where I had lost all the support that I had come to expect, honestly, because I had been spoiled to be come up in my career in these really safe environments. and. So it was like a big blow to my worldview of what it's like to work in mental health, to be confronted with that reality that so many people experience, so many therapists experience. Working within traumatized systems that the system is just trying to get through each day because it has so many cracks and flaws that continue to break and crumble. So leaving the therapists, the providers, the clinicians, to be isolated, to have to white knuckle it through every single day and feeling really disempowered, knowing that they have to be able to support their family. They have to be able to take care of themselves. And this is the only opportunity that they maybe have or that they feel is available to them at the time. Yeah, that that resonates with me. And I'm sure it resonates with so many other professional healers and nurses, doctors, care, helping professions will at some point in there or maybe every day will have experienced vicarious trauma and who aren't aware won't know that it is impacting their personal life as it was for you when your partner at the time sent you that link. (laughs) So he's now my husband, but we were dating at the time and he's a jazz musician. He one day sent me an email and it was like, the results of a Google search. And I'm paraphrasing, but essentially he had Googled like how to help my trauma therapist girlfriend who is like struggling with her job or something. And he sent me all these articles, this Google search results on vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress. And I was angry because I was like, I literally teach on this. I literally teach other people all about vicarious trauma and how to deal with it. So who are you to tell me that I have VT? But that was my ego. That was my defense, right? Those were all my defense mechanisms showing up because 
I wasn't really ready to look in the mirror in that moment because I was having to use so much energy to white knuckle through every day because that's what I had to do. I had to get through each day. I didn't see that there were other ways to approach the work that I was doing or ways to get support that I was lacking. Yeah. And I love that you're sharing this and you're really transparent with your reactions, him sending you that link, because I'm sure that everyone can relate to it. That's how they react and not knowing that, oh, it's because I was not ready or I didn't realize it's my work that's causing me to react this way. It still serves as a barometer of how well I'm taking care of myself or not, because some of my big signs when I'm not taking care of myself and vicarious trauma are irritability and isolation. Mm -hmm. So He's going to be the first to notice that I'm more pissy and that I am pushing everyone away, right? Because he is around me every day. And I also am really good at compartmentalizing. And so I can turn it on when I'm in session. And then once I'm done working, he sees what is really happening underneath that veil if I'm having to work really hard to to white knuckle it through things. Yeah, I could definitely think around. 2020, when we had that surge of clients, right? Because we all went virtual and everybody just needed a therapist at the time. And now too, what I found, I think I was going towards burnout because there was a lot of vicarious trauma that I was experiencing without realizing it at the time. I just wanted to help as a trauma therapist. We just want to help because the feeling helping them get through it or helping them teach them the skills to live with that trauma or to manage it is so rewarding. And uh, maybe that's a selfish reason, but it's very helpful to them. And it just feels amazing when we can just take that pain a little less for them. But I didn't realize what was happening to me was that there was a lot of racial, a lot of injustices was coming up and the clients that I was seeing were affected and didn't realize that it was racial trauma, racial microaggressions that were happening to them. And not realizing that they are affected with the news that are happening. That's also not the direct trauma, but the secondary traumatic stress. Yeah, secondary traumatic stress. And so they were going through that. And then when they share with me their stories, then I was feeling that same secondary trauma. But then the buildup of it, as we continue to hear other people's stories, we build up and then we don't realize that's also just as bad as any other types of trauma. Yeah, totally. And I'm glad that you're bringing up the racial trauma piece too. I actually am doing like a three-part series with some colleagues at University of California, San Francisco. And last night was part two. And that was a big thing we were talking about last night was the connection, the interplay between vicarious trauma and racial trauma for clinicians and providers, and particularly for providers of color, Mm -hmm. and working to understand how they can show up in very similar ways for us as clinicians, and why especially BIPOC providers in particular can be at even increased risk of experiencing vicarious trauma, which can start this trajectory towards burnout, because clinicians and providers of color They are likely experiencing that racial trauma as well. They are supporting and caring for and advocating for clients and patients who are experiencing that. And then oftentimes, especially within organizations, clinicians and providers of color, they carry this burden of minority tax where they are asked to do the trainings on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which in a lot of ways, it's understandable why they're asked to do that. And many really value and want to be able to provide that service to their colleagues, to their institutions. But a lot of times they feel like they can't say no, because if they say no, then they are failing their people, right? They're failing the people that look like them or that live lifestyles like them or whatever it might be. There's a lot of visible and invisible traits that can put any of us into a position of disempowerment and into a group of minority status. And so if we say no to teaching about something, then it feels like we're failing our community. And so when, especially for clinicians of color are working in spaces like this, 
being aware of what vicarious trauma looks like and how it feels and how to recognize it as early as possible is really important while also being able to acknowledge that racial trauma is going to be happening too and they can look very similar. Also knowing that addressing them can take a similar pathway as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a double whammy when it comes to addressing these things and managing the impact. I love that you brought that up. And I think also in the past where racial trauma was not as talked about in our field. And so a lot of therapists maybe misdiagnose these in people of color and they would yeah. assume that it's anxiety, depression. And so what they focus on is focusing on helping them change their mindset regarding the actual discrimination, making it sound like it's an internal problem, internal issue when it's actually external, right? Yeah. Because it happens like outside of them. So then that can enhance the mm-hmm. effect of the trauma. So I think that's another important thing for us. Yeah, it can feel it's an experience of victim blaming, Mm -hmm. right? Oh, no, this isn't happening. This isn't real. You're just feeling anxious. Dismissive, right? And then that just kind of traumatizes them. Yeah, I totally get what you mean about as a person of color, when we feel like we have to say yes, but even when it's hard because we're still going through it. It's like we still go through it every day. So it is hard for us to feel like we can be our best when a part of us is still struggling. Or healing. Well, and or you already process. have the responsibilities that are on your plate anyway. So when, I'll just talk to you, Grace. Let's say mm-hmm. someone asks you to do a training on what it is like to be like an Asian American female, right? Maybe that's something that you want to be able to do that's important to you, but you're thinking about like, oh my gosh, this is like stacking on top of all the other things that I have to do. And so that can be a really difficult decision point and can feel like it's a burden. And so it can actually take some of the fulfillment out of it, too, even if you do decide to say yes. Yeah, I would totally say yes to it just because. Right. And that's exactly that is exactly it. Right. You're just, automatically. Yes. Just because sharing your story will help others. And it's again, that's like the healer part, the helper part of me. Like, I just want to help. And if by sharing my story can help others, I will say yes. But again, we don't think about how difficult it could be and the stress it could take in our body. And when it is value aligned, it doesn't feel as heavy. It doesn't feel like a burden necessarily. Like certainly it's something that you got to carve out time for. But that's something that's important is thinking about when we're asked to do things like this, to speak for our communities, is the ask from this other person, is it aligned with my goals and values right now in my personal and professional lives? And when you can say yes to that, then it's easier to do that thing. It doesn't feel as taxing and time consuming as opposed to that's really not something that I'm working on. That's not something that is consistent with how I'm functioning or the values that I am experiencing and expressing in my life. Yeah. When you know the value of your stress, it doesn't feel like stress. It's more empowering, right? Yeah. So it motivates you. But I want to make sure, and I love that we're talking about this because this is what you're doing in your program, right? You're helping other therapists work through their vicarious trauma. So let's hear about Yeah, I have an online community membership called the Brave Trauma Therapist Collective. And it is an incredible group of trauma therapists who come together both in our online community and in live Zoom calls to talk about this stuff, to talk about how do we name vicarious trauma? How do we tame it and manage it? And how do we reframe the experiences that we have in our work as trauma therapists so that we can really benefit from vicarious resilience and post-traumatic growth that we can experience as a result of the work that we do with the people that we serve? And so inside of Brave, we have bi-monthly calls. We're able to get together and talk about specific content each month and also to have consultation together. So not necessarily case consultation that therapists will often do. And certainly we can talk about cases, but the consultation call is more of an open space to process what it's like to be a trauma therapist and to share difficulties and roadblocks that are coming up as we're trying to prioritize 
our needs and to really put on our oxygen masks first so that the best trauma therapist, the best person in our professional and personal lives as we can. Yeah. You said name it, tame it, and reframe it. Name it, it. tame it, reframe it. Yeah. So that's the signature framework that we move through in Brave. So every month we're in one of those places. And we actually continuously move through those three topics, those three areas, because naming vicarious trauma is we have to do that regularly because VT likes to be sneaky and to be a chameleon and all of a sudden show up wearing a different mask. So we have to always come back to that. We have to be constantly talking about the ways that we tame vicarious trauma and manage it because we are changing as human beings and the stressors and the things we're experiencing are changing. And say with reframing it. So sometimes we are able to really thrive on all of the little things that we see our clients doing as they overcome trauma. Other times we need to have bigger wins because we're carrying such a heavy weight. And so coming back and going through this cycle of name it, tame it, reframe it over and over again is really important because it's an ever changing and evolving process. And you mentioned VT can mask itself. Can you explain to our listeners what that means? Like, how does that look like? Yeah. So like I said earlier, my kind of top red flags are irritability and isolation. Mm -hmm. But something that I'm learning about myself right now is a better understanding, for example, of how vicarious trauma shows up in my body. And that's something that I haven't been as aware of, or maybe vicarious trauma hasn't shown up in that way. So in terms of maybe headaches or stomach. Also, vicarious trauma, it can show up in our emotional world, our physical, our relational, occupational, spiritual. And sometimes it's heavier in one of these areas than others. And so being able to pick up on the ways that vicarious trauma shifts in terms of how it is expressing itself in our life is really important and is a moving target. And I really love what you said about being able to tame it. Can you give us three tips on how we can tame our vicarious trauma? Yeah, the first and most important one is community and is talking about it. So one of the greatest risk factors for vicarious trauma turning into burnout is isolation. And vicarious trauma, as we know, like for me, for example, will cause us to isolate. And so I mean, that's why something like the Brave Collective is so important, because there is this built in community of people that are showing up together and are Mm -hmm. checking in with each other proactively. But the first and most important thing to do to tame vicarious trauma is to know with whom you can talk to about this stuff. And there are going to be things that you only really want to or are able to talk to colleagues about. But there may be other ways like incorporating your non-professional relationships can be helpful and beneficial too. The second thing, and it seems counterintuitive, but it is really a mindset of being open to how difficult your work is. One way to think about it is being open to having your heart broken every day. And that sounds awful. Right. But what it it does does (laughs) is it actually it gives us permission to be flexible and to be present and to show up because like you were talking about earlier, it really actually fills our cup up to share compassion with the people Mm -hmm. that we serve. And when we are open to having our heart broken, we can be present with our clients and we can have that refueling experience of sharing compassion. But being open to that also allows us to have the natural beginning, middle and end experience of what it's like to sit with people in trauma. And so then that allows our brain to know when that stressor of listening to and working with trauma has ended. And so it really seems very counterintuitive because you would think that you'd want to like brace against that and figure out how to detach from it. But the more you can be present in your work as a therapist, as a helper, as a healer, the more your brain is able to understand when your work is starting and when it's ending. And so you can wring out that sponge of vicarious trauma more effectively. And then the last thing is just being clear with yourself about what are the things that actually help you. So a lot of times we just kind of like talk about self-care. We either tack it on at the end or 
It's almost used as a punishment of, oh, you're burnt out. Why aren't you taking care of enough? And for me and the work that I do, yes, self-care is necessary. That's what Tame It is about, right? Mm -hmm. How can we manage this stuff? But we don't have to recreate the wheel. And let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. What are the things that work best for you? And for example, for me, yoga, regular yoga is really important. I also have routines around walking my dog. Fortunately, he forces me to get out and walk him. But that is a piece of taking care of myself. And also being able to have time by myself, but with intentionality. So not isolating and trying to shut down, but having that time by myself, even if it's just five or 10 minutes, where I'm able to do a gratitude practice, or I'm able to take even just five minutes to breathe. But those are things that work for me. And yeah. they may not work for you or for other people. So it's being clear on what are your top two or three go to things that truly help without having to recreate the wheel. And what I do, what works for me is running like in between my clients, I know which clients are going to be my heaviest for the day. So I just scan through my schedule and see which one I'm going to need to really refuel in between. Yep. So I would go for a run and I get that my me time, just get that energy back and be prepared for my next one because I love that. I think that's what it is. That's what I'm doing. I'm preparing myself to get my heart broken because I know that I'm a very empathetic, sensitive person. So I know that whatever they share with me, I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel all of it, but I also know that it's going to help them. So that compassionate piece is very crucial, like you said. So I love that. And I love all of those tips, refueling, re-energizing, taking some time for yourself and giving your brain some rest with your gratitude journal. I love all of that. And I think your program is so valuable for us helping professionals, trauma therapists, because the work that we do is not easy. And I know that myself, and I know that if we don't take care of ourselves, it can spill into our personal life. So we don't want to get there. And we want to make sure we want to continue to be helpers out there because there are so many people in need. And it's not like we're obligated to. It's just that um, there's a reason why we chose this. I think it fills our cup and it energizes us because not everyone can. Jenny, and I know we're running out of time, but if you can let our listeners know where to find you and how to sign up for this amazing program that you've set up for all of us trauma therapists. Yeah, totally. So Enrollment will be opening again in the spring. And so for now, the best way to get connected with me is to actually go and download my free vicarious trauma tracker, which helps you to begin to learn how to name vicarious trauma and is a tool that can be used over and over again because vicarious trauma is sneaky so that you can get clarity on what it looks like for you at any given moment. And you can grab that at braveproviders.com slash VT tracker. So like vicarious trauma tracker. And I'm sure we'll put that in the show, yes, notes, show notes too. And then I'm on Instagram and TikTok at Brave Providers. So you can always follow me there as well. I just want other trauma therapists, any helpers, healers out there to know that they deserve to be cared for too. And just like you were talking about a minute ago, Grace, we are called to helping and healing professions for so many different reasons. And a big reason that I do the work that I am doing inside of Brave is because I don't want people to get to the point of burnout where they leave the profession because they feel like it's their only life raft, right? please leave the helping profession if you want to do that. But I want them to be able to do that from an informed place and making that as a grounded choice as opposed to, oh my gosh, this is the only way I can survive. So I want to help people to avoid that burnout so they can either make the grounded choice to stay in the profession or make the grounded choice to switch and pivot and do something different. Yeah, it's like finding the meaning in their work. Yeah. Reminding them of the meaning of their work so they don't burn out. Yep, exactly. Yes. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you again for your time and for joining me today. And I look forward to having you be a guest again. Thank you, Grace. It has been so wonderful speaking with you and getting to share my story with you. And I really look forward to next time. If you resonate at all with the stories on this podcast and you're thinking about a change in your current situation, in your career, in your relationship, or maybe even in yourself, what's holding you back from taking the first step? 
Find out by taking the "What's Your Biggest Self Sabotage" quiz that you can find on my website at mariagracewolk.com. Until next time, stay kind and own your journey. Thank you again for your time today. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to hit subscribe, rate, and review. I would so appreciate it. The high rate and reviews will help others find the podcast so we can amplify, normalize, and break the mental health stigma. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. This is given with the understanding that neither the host or the guest are providing legal, mental health, or other professional information. If you need a professional, you should find one. This podcast does not substitute for personal professional services.